Section four of Notes on Nursing by Florence Nightingale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section four Noise. Unnecessary noise, or noise that creates an expectation in the mind, is that which hurts a patient. It is rarely the loudness of the noise, the effect upon the organ of the ear itself, which appears to affect the sick. How well a patient will generally bear, for example, the putting up of a scaffolding close to the house, when he cannot bear the talking, still less the whispering, especially if it be of a familiar voice outside his door. There are certain patients, no doubt, especially where there is slight concussion or other disturbance of the brain, who are affected by mere noise. But intermittent noise, or sudden and sharp noise, in these, as in all other cases, affects far more than continuous noise, noise with jar far more than noise without. Of one thing you may be certain, that anything which wakes a patient suddenly out of his sleep will invariably put him into a state of greater excitement, do him more serious, ay, and lasting mischief, than any continuous noise, however loud. Never to allow a patient to be waked, intentionally or accidentally, is a sine qua non of all good nursing. If he is roused out of his first sleep, he is almost certain to have no more sleep. It is a curious, but quite intelligible fact, that if a patient is waked after a few hours, instead of a few minutes' sleep, he is much more likely to sleep again. Because pain, like irritability of brain, perpetuates and intensifies itself. If you have gained a respite of either in sleep, you have gained more than the mere respite. Both the probability of recurrence, and of the same intensity, will be diminished, whereas both will be terribly increased by want of sleep. This is the reason why sleep is so all-important. This is the reason why a patient waked in the early part of his sleep loses not only his sleep, but his power to sleep. A healthy person, who allows himself to sleep during the day, will lose his sleep at night. But it is exactly the reverse with the sick generally. The more they sleep, the better will they be able to sleep. I have often been surprised at the thoughtlessness, resulting in cruelty, quite unintentionally, of friends or of doctors who will hold a long conversation just in the room or passage adjoining to the room of the patient, who is either every moment expecting them to come in, or who has just seen them, and knows they are talking about him. If he is an amiable patient, he will try to occupy his attention elsewhere, and not to listen, and this makes matters worse, for the strain upon his attention, and the effort he makes, are so great that it is well if he is not worse for hours after. If it is a whispered conversation in the same room, then it is absolutely cruel, for it is impossible that the patient's attention should not be involuntarily strained to hear. Walking on tiptoe, doing anything in the room very slowly, are injurious, for exactly the same reasons. A firm, light, quick step, a steady, quick hand, are the desiderata, not the slow, lingering, shuffling foot, the timid, uncertain touch. Slowness is not gentleness, though it is often mistaken for such. Quickness, lightness, and gentleness are quite compatible. Again, if friends and doctors did but watch, as nurses can and should watch, the features sharpening, the eyes growing almost wild, of fever patients, who are listening for the entrance from the corridor, of the persons whose voices they are hearing there, these would never run the risk again of creating such unnecessary noise as undoubtedly induced or aggravated delirium in many cases. I have known such, in one case death ensued. It is but fair to say that this death was attributed to fright. It was the result of a long whispered conversation, within sight of the patient, about an impending operation. But anyone who has known the more than stoicism, the cheerful coolness, with which the certainty of an operation will be accepted by any patient, capable of bearing an operation at all, if it is properly communicated to him, will hesitate to believe that it was mere fear which produced, as was averred, the fatal result in this instance. 
it was rather the uncertainty, the strained expectation as to what was to be decided upon. I need hardly say that the other common cause, namely for a doctor or friend to leave the patient and communicate his opinion on the result of his visit to the friends just outside the patient's door or in the adjoining room after the visit, but within hearing or knowledge of the patient, is, if possible, worst of all. It is, I think, alarming, peculiarly at this time, when the female ink-bottles are perpetually impressing upon us woman's particular worth and general missionariness, to see that the dress of women is daily more and more unfitting them for any mission or usefulness at all. It is equally unfitted for all poetic and all domestic purposes. A man is now a more handy and far less objectionable being in a sick-room than a woman. Compelled by her dress, every woman now either shuffles or waddles. Only a man can cross the floor of a sick-room without shaking it. What is become of women's light step, the firm, light, quick step we have been asking for? Unnecessary noise, then, is the most cruel absence of care which can be inflicted either on sick or well. For, in all these remarks, the sick are only mentioned as suffering in a greater proportion than the well from precisely the same causes. Unnecessary, although slight noise, injures a sick person much more than necessary noise of a much greater amount. All doctrines about mysterious affinities and aversions will be found to resolve themselves very much, if not entirely, into presence or absence of care in these things. A nurse who rustles, I am speaking of nurses professional and unprofessional, is the horror of a patient, though perhaps he does not know why. The fidget of silk and of crinoline, the rattling of keys, the creaking of stays and of shoes, will do a patient more harm than all the medicines in the world will do him good. The noiseless step of women, the noiseless drapery of women, are mere figures of speech in this day. Her skirts, and well if they do not throw down some piece of furniture, will at least brush against every article in the room as she moves. Again, one nurse cannot open the door without making everything rattle, or she opens the door unnecessarily often, for want of remembering all the articles that might be brought in at once. A good nurse will always make sure that no door or window in her patient's room shall rattle or creak, that no blind or curtain shall, by any change of wind through the open window, be made to flap. Especially will she be careful of all this before she leaves her patients for the night. If you wait till your patients tell you, or remind you of these things, where is the use of their having a nurse? There are more shy than exacting patients in all classes, and many a patient passes a bad night, time after time, rather than remind his nurse every night of all the things she has forgotten. If there are blinds to your windows, always take care to have them well up when they are not being used. A little piece slipping down and flapping with every draught will distract a patient. All hurry or bustle is peculiarly painful to the sick, and when a patient has compulsory occupations to engage him, instead of having simply to amuse himself, it becomes doubly injurious. The friend who remains standing and fidgeting about while a patient is talking business to him, or the friend who sits and proses, the one from an idea of not letting the patient talk, the other from an idea of amusing him, each is equally inconsiderate. Always sit down when a sick person is talking business to you, show no signs of hurry, give complete attention and full consideration if your advice is wanted, and go away the moment the subject is ended. Always sit within the patient's view, so that when you speak to him he has not painfully to turn his head round in order to look at you. Everybody involuntarily looks at the person speaking. If you make this act a wearisome one on the part of the patient, you are doing him harm. So also, if by continuing to stand, you make him continuously raise his eyes to see you. Be as motionless as possible, and never gesticulate in speaking to the sick. Never make a patient repeat a message or request, especially if it be some time after. 
Occupied patients are often accused of doing too much of their own business. They are instinctively right. How often you hear the person, charged with the request of giving the message or writing the letter, say half an hour afterwards to the patient, Did you appoint twelve o'clock? Or, What did you say was the address? Or ask perhaps some much more agitating question, thus causing the patient the effort of memory, or worse still, of decision, all over again. It is really less exertion to him to write his letters himself. This is the almost universal experience of occupied invalids. This brings us to another caution. Never speak to an invalid from behind, nor from the door, nor from any distance from him, nor when he is doing anything. The official politeness of servants in these things is so grateful to invalids that many prefer, without knowing why, having none but servants about them. These things are not fancy. If we consider that, with sick as with well, every thought decomposes some nervous matter, that decomposition as well as recomposition of nervous matter is always going on, and more quickly with the sick than with the well, that, to obtrude abruptly another thought upon the brain, while it is in the act of destroying nervous matter by thinking, is calling upon it to make a new exertion. If we consider these things, which are facts, not fancies, we shall remember that we are doing positive injury by interrupting, by startling a fanciful person, as it is called. Alas, it is no fancy. If the invalid is forced, by his avocations, to continue occupations requiring much thinking, the injury is doubly great. In feeding a patient suffering under delirium or stupor, you may suffocate him by giving him his food suddenly. But if you rub his lips gently with a spoon and thus attract his attention, he will swallow the food unconsciously, but with perfect safety. Thus it is with the brain. If you offer it a thought, especially one requiring a decision, abruptly, you do it a real, not fanciful injury. Never speak to a sick person suddenly, but at the same time do not keep his expectation on the tiptoe. This rule, indeed, applies to the well quite as much as to the sick. I have never known persons who exposed themselves for years to constant interruption, who did not muddle away their intellects by it at last. The process with them may be accomplished without pain. With the sick, pain gives warning of the injury. Do not meet or overtake a patient who is moving about in order to speak to him or to give him any message or letter. You might just as well give him a box on the ear. I have seen a patient fall flat on the ground who was standing when his nurse came into the room. This was an accident which might have happened to the most careful nurse. But the other is done with intention. A patient in such a state is not going to the East Indies. If you would wait ten seconds, or walk ten yards further, any promenade he could make would be over. You do not know the effort it is to a patient to remain standing for even a quarter of a minute to listen to you. If I had not seen the thing done by the kindest nurses and friends, I should have thought this caution quite superfluous. Patients are often accused of being able to do much more when nobody is by. It is quite true that they can. Unless nurses can be brought to attend to considerations of the kind of which we have given here but a few specimens, a very weak patient finds it really much less exertion to do things for himself than to ask for them. And he will, in order to do them, very innocently and from instinct, calculate the time his nurse is likely to be absent, from a fear of her coming in upon him, or speaking to him, just at the moment when he finds it quite as much as he can do to crawl from his bed to his chair, or from one room to another, or downstairs, or out of doors for a few minutes. Some extra call made upon his attention at that moment will quite upset him. In these cases, you may be sure that a patient in the state we have described does not make such exertions more than once or twice a day, and probably much about the same hour every day. And it is hard indeed, if nurse and friends cannot calculate, so as to let him make them undisturbed. Remember that many patients can walk who cannot stand or even sit up. 
standing, is, of all positions, the most trying to a weak patient. Everything you do in a patient's room, after he is put up for the night, increases tenfold the risk of his having a bad night. But, if you rouse him up after he has fallen asleep, you do not risk, you secure him a bad night. One hint I would give to all who attend or visit the sick, to all who have to pronounce an opinion upon sickness or its progress. Come back and look at your patient after he has had an hour's animated conversation with you. It is the best test of his real state we know. But never pronounce upon him from merely seeing what he does or how he looks during such a conversation. Learn also carefully and exactly, if you can, how he passed the night after it. People rarely, if ever, faint while making an exertion. It is after it is over. Indeed, almost every effect of overexertion appears after, not during such exertion. It is the highest folly to judge of the sick, as is so often done, when you see them merely during a period of excitement. People have very often died of that which, it has been proclaimed at the time, has done them no harm. Remember never to lean against, sit upon, or unnecessarily shake, or even touch the bed in which a patient lies. This is invariably a painful annoyance. If you shake the chair on which he sits, he has a point by which to steady himself in his feet. But on a bed or sofa, he is entirely at your mercy, and he feels every jar you give him all through him. In all that we have said, both here and elsewhere, let it be distinctly understood that we are not speaking of hypochondriacs. To distinguish between real and fancied disease forms an important branch of the education of a nurse. To manage fancy patients forms an important branch of her duties. But the nursing which real and that which fancied patients require is of different or rather of opposite character, and the latter will not be spoken of here. Indeed, many of the symptoms which are here mentioned are those which distinguish real from fancied disease. It is true that hypochondriacs very often do that behind a nurse's back which they would not do before her face. Many such I have had as patients, who scarcely ate anything at their regular meals, but if you concealed food for them in a drawer, they would take it at night or in secret. But this is from quite a different motive. They do it from the wish to conceal whereas the real patient will often boast to his nurse or doctor, if these do not shake their heads at him, of how much he has done, or eaten, or walked. To return to real disease. Conciseness and decision are, above all things, necessary with the sick. Let your thought expressed to them be concisely and decidedly expressed. What doubt and hesitation there may be in your own mind must never be communicated to theirs, not even, I would rather say especially not, in little things. Let your doubt be to yourself, your decision to them. People who think outside their heads, the whole process of whose thought appears, like Homer's, in the act of secretion, who tell everything that led them towards this conclusion and away from that, ought never to be with the sick. Irresolution is what all patients most dread. Rather than meet this in others, they will collect all their data and make up their minds for themselves. A change of mind in others, whether it is regarding an operation or rewriting a letter, always injures the patient more than the being called upon to make up his mind to the most dreaded or difficult decision. Farther than this, in very many cases, the imagination in disease is far more active and vivid than it is in health. If you propose to the patient change of air to one place one hour and to another the next, he has, in each case, immediately constituted himself in imagination, the tenant of the place, gone over the whole premises in idea, and you have tired him as much by displacing his imagination as if you had actually carried him over both places. Above all, Leave the sick room quickly, and come into it quickly. Not suddenly, not with a rush. But don't let the patient be wearily waiting for when you will be out of the room, or when you will be in it. 
conciseness and decision in your movements, as well as your words, are necessary in the sick-room, as necessary as absence of hurry and bustle. To possess yourself entirely will ensure you from either failing, either loitering or hurrying. If a patient has to see not only to his own, but also to his nurse's punctuality, or perseverance, or readiness, or calmness, to any or all of these things, he is far better without that nurse than with her, however valuable and handy her services may otherwise be to him, and however incapable he may be of rendering them to himself. With regard to reading aloud in the sick-room, my experience is that when the sick are too ill to read to themselves, they can seldom bear to be read to. Children, eye patients, and uneducated persons are exceptions, or when there is any mechanical difficulty in reading. People who like to be read to have generally not much the matter with them, while in fevers, or where there is much irritability of brain, the effort of listening to reading aloud has often brought on delirium. I speak with great diffidence, because there is an almost universal impression that it is sparing the sick to read aloud to them. But two things are certain. One, if there is some matter which must be read to a sick person, do it slowly. People often think that the way to get it over with least fatigue to him is to get it over in least time. They gabble, they plunge and gallop through the reading. There never was a greater mistake. Houdin, the conjurer, says that the way to make a story seem short is to tell it slowly. So it is with reading to the sick. I have often heard a patient say to such a mistaken reader, Don't read it to me, tell it me. Unconsciously he is aware that this will regulate the plunging, the reading with unequal paces, slurring over one part, instead of leaving it out altogether if it is unimportant, and mumbling another. If the reader lets his own attention wander, and then stops to read up to himself, or finds he has read the wrong bit, then it is all over with the poor patient's chance of not suffering. Very few people know how to read to the sick. Very few people read aloud as pleasantly even as they speak. In reading they sing, they hesitate, they stammer, they hurry, they mumble, when in speaking they do none of these things. Reading aloud to the sick ought always to be rather slow and exceedingly distinct, but not mouthing, rather monotonous but not sing-song, rather loud but not noisy, and, above all, not too long. Be very sure of what your patient can bear. 2. The extraordinary habit of reading to oneself in a sick-room, and reading aloud to the patient any bits which will amuse him or more often the reader, is unaccountably thoughtless. What do you think the patient is thinking of during your gaps of non-reading? Do you think that he amuses himself upon what you have read, for precisely the time it pleases you to go on reading to yourself, and that his attention is ready for something else, at precisely the time it pleases you to begin reading again? Whether the person thus read to be sick or well, whether he be doing nothing or doing something else while thus being read to, the self-absorption and want of observation of the person who does it is equally difficult to understand, although very often the readee is too amiable to say how much it hurts him. One thing more. From the flimsy manner in which most modern houses are built, where every step on the stairs and along the floors is felt all over the house, the higher the story, the greater the vibration. It is inconceivable how much the sick suffer by having anybody overhead. In the solidly built, old houses, which fortunately most hospitals are, the noise and shaking is comparatively trifling. But it is a serious cause of suffering in lightly built houses, and with the irritability peculiar to some diseases. Better far put such patients at the top of the house even with the additional fatigue of stairs, if you cannot secure the room above them being untenanted. You may otherwise bring on a state of restlessness which no opium will subdue. Do not neglect the warning when a patient tells you that he feels every step above him to cross his heart. 
remember that every noise a patient cannot see partakes of the character of suddenness to him, and I am persuaded that patients with these peculiarly irritable nerves are positively less injured by having persons in the same room with them than overhead or separated by only a thin compartment. Any sacrifice to secure silence for these cases is worth while, because no air, however good, no attendance, however careful, will do anything for such cases without quiet. End of section 4